Eve that I am live on Facebook. Yeah, there's a little thing that says you are live. So I'm live on Facebook. I'm just letting my group know. So I am live on Facebook now, and uh, so good to see y'all. Now I'm gonna need you to hold on for one second because I gotta get on Insta. If I got my phone, hold on, I'll be right back. I'm still live, I'm not going anywhere, just hold on. Hey there, Prophet Sheila. Okay, I'll be right back, hold on. I gotta get my phone, hold on. There we go. There's my sister. Hey, sis. I'm trying to get on Insta. At the same time, I'm on Facebook. I got my phone for that, and I had left my phone upstairs. So that's all right. We're going to fix that now. And I'm on Instagram Live. <clears throat> Okay, I'm very excited about today's live prophetic word because I know it's gonna deliver a lot of people. I know that what the Holy Spirit gave me to say today is some stuff that's been sorely lacking, sorely lacking. Okay, now my ist is going, all right, good. My sister said she heard my footsteps. That's right, because I had to run and get my phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, now here we go, uh, 2.30, so let's dive right on in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to come before you again and hear from you, O oh God. Lord, I should forgive me for any sin, wash me clean, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Let the Spirit of God breathe, breathe through me, O oh God. I must decrease so you can increase, O oh God. I must die so that you can live through me. So let every word spoken, oh God, be what you want. Oh God, let it be what, what you want the people to hear, oh God, that you might be glorified in all things, that the saints would be edified, that hell would be terrified and sinners would be mortified to live one more day without you because you're the only source of life. You're the only place we can go to live. We have to stay attached to you, oh God, you are life. We can't find life anywhere else but you. Oh God, so let all things be done to your glory and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word, oh God, for all that believe in, receive in, and walk in it. I thank you for it and I believe you for it and I'm looking for you to do great things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. <clears throat> all right, today's prophetic word is basics. Today's live prophetic word is basics. What we're going to talk about is basics. Now, I am amazed. I am amazed at how many believers can't articulate some very basic things. How sometimes when people come to us with questions, uh, questions about our faith and questions about life, there are unfortunately so many believers that can't answer some basic questions. They can't do the basic stuff. So what the Holy Ghost told me to talk about today was some basics. We're gonna deal with some basic stuff. Now, some people, I can tell you off the bat, right off the bat, that some people have been going to church for a 10 and a 12 and a 15 and a 20 and a 30 years, and they're not gonna know 
some of what I'm talking about. For some people, it's going to be the first time, first time they heard some of the stuff that I'm saying. Okay. So let's start off from the beginning. <clears throat> what are our ABCs? Those are the building blocks of the English language. Uh, we have to learn the alphabet. The alphabet are the individual letters that we have to learn, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that makes up words. What is one, two, three? Well, that's the beginning of our numerical system because we have a, a number system that's based on uh, a 10 based system. So it's zero through nine that we have our basic operators and every number we have in our system is based on zero through nine and your four basic operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Uh, when we learn basics of music, what is that? Well, first we learn our staff lines and our staff lines are E, G, B, D, F. And we memorize those by saying every good boy does fine, every musician does that. And then we have to learn our staff spaces, F, A, C, E, or face. That's the beginning of you learning how to read music, how to understand music on the page. You have to understand your lines and your spaces, and you have to understand your clefs, your treble clefs, C clefs, your bass clefs, okay? That's basic stuff for understanding written music. The way we do it in the West, they don't do it that way all over the world, but the way we do music in the West, those are the basics. Then when we get into building words in English, we have to learn types of words. And the types of words we learn fall into our basic categories, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. Again, those are very, very basic. And we get into things like definite articles, uh, the, indefinite articles, a uh, or an, stuff like that. Basics for forming words, forming sentences, learning subjects and uh, predicates and direct uh, objects, things like that, to help us with our basic understanding of how to form sentences, how to speak the language so we can communicate what it is we're trying to say. That's all basic stuff. And so if you don't get a grasp on your ABCs and your types of words, your nouns, your verbs, your adjectives, your adverbs, if you don't get a grasp on your digits, zero through nine, plus your four basic operators, if you don't get a grasp on uh, your lines and your spaces, your staff lines in music, if you don't get a grasp on your basics, then you can't really go anywhere. There's only so much you can do in life or any kind of endeavor if you don't have your basic stuff down. Okay. Well, I'll stop by to tell you there are some Christian basics. There are some life basics. And like I said before, I'm constantly amazed at the number of Christians that can't articulate these basics to people that ask. And when you can't articulate them, then you come up with some kind of off the wall, God works in mysterious ways as one is to perform some kind of, <laughs> some kind of something you heard maybe a couple of times when you were growing up, some kind of stuff that does not answer people's questions, that does not give people what they need, and it doesn't give you what you need. Let me show you what that looks like. Every time I hear somebody say at the funeral of a child, that heaven must have needed an extra angel. So God called you home early. I just face palm like this right here. I just face palm and shake my head because no, there's so many angels in heaven. We don't have a number big enough to count them. Number one. Number two, if by some strange coincidence, God ever ran out of anything, which is impossible. But for the sake of argument, if God ever ran out of angels, he would not have to kill a child on earth to bring them to heaven because he needed an angel. Oh, Lord have mercy. I can't stand it when people say that. I can't stand it when people say that because none of that is right. Heaven doesn't run out of angels. And if by some chance the Lord did, he could make some more angels. That's why one of his name is the Lord of hosts. He did not have to kill your child to bring them to heaven because heaven must have needed it. No, no. So when you say stuff like that, you don't have any type of theological or life understanding as to what's going on. And that's because once again, you never got any basics to say stuff like that. And that's why a bunch of re religious people have run around and said things that made people hate God. 
because you gave him this idea that, that God brought some type of tragedy in your life or God brought something on you. And that, no, no, God has no desire to bring tragedy in your life. I'll explain that just in a few seconds. But I'm trying to help you to understand the importance of basics. Because many times as we go through our Christian lives, we are missing them. And I'm going to tell you why we're missing them. But I'm going to start off, I'm going to go in order. So I'm going to start off with the setup. What would you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, I'm going to start off with the setup. There's a whole lot of people don't understand the setup. What do you mean by the setup? I mean the way life on earth is set up. The way God designed this life, how does it work? You'd be amazed at how many Christians cannot properly answer that question. Been going to church for 20 umpteen uh, Google years and can't answer that question I just asked. What's the setup? Here's the setup. There are three basic laws that govern everything that God does. So it's not just a setup on earth, it's a setup in heaven, it's a setup in hell. Anything that God created is subject to these three laws. And here they are. Law number one, you have a choice. But what do you have a choice between? You have a choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing. You do not have a choice between good and good. You have a choice between good and evil. You do not have a choice between good and neutral. Because a whole lot of people say, well, I don't believe in God and walk away. And that don't mean nothing because God's existence is not based on whether or not you believe in him or not. So just because you say you don't believe in God doesn't change anything. That's a choice. And you have a choice. You are free to choose. And everything God made is free to choose between life or death, blessing or cursing, good or evil. You have freedom of choice, but you don't have freedom from choice. So you are either going to make choices that pull you more toward the life side, or you're going to make choices that pull you more towards the death side. That's the setup. That's law number one. Law number two is every choice comes with a consequence and you're going to get locked in it. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I see it. <laughs> every choice, law number two is that every choice comes with a consequence and you're going to have to live with what you choose. So law number one is we have freedom of choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing, and your choice is going to pull you to one side or the other. But law number two is every choice, I mean, every piece of food you eat, every word that comes out your mouth, every relationship you have, everything you watch on TV, every thought in your head has a consequence. Every choice has a consequence and you're going to get locked in it. What do you mean by that? I mean, you're going to have to live with what you choose. You're going to have to live with what you choose. You're going to have to live with what you choose. Now, yes, there's forgiveness and yes, there's mercy, but forgiveness don't wipe out consequences. That's where a lot of religious people get confused. If I turn on a table saw and I run my arm through that saw foolishly and I cut off my hand at the wrist and I say, oh, Lord, oh, my God, what have I done? And I look up to heaven and I say, God, please forgive me. The Lord will forgive me. Then I better run myself to the hospital and hope the doctors can reattach my hand or I better have enough faith to grow another hand. Either one can happen. If neither one of those things happen, I don't have enough faith to grow another hand and the doctors can't sew my hand back on. Now I'm gonna have to go through the rest of my life missing a hand because I cut it off. God forgave me for that foolishness, but it didn't wipe out the consequence. <laughs> That's where religious people just go all crazy telling you that you can just do whatever you want to do because you can be forgiven. The Lord has already given us a blanket promise of forgiveness with no condemnation. Okay, that's what the cross was about. But forgiveness don't wipe out consequences. So if you don't eat right and exercise, your body's going to reflect that. I don't care if you've got the Holy Ghost running out your toes. <laughs> okay. And this is where religious people get crazy. They teach all these crazy things. And that's why I'm so adamant to get people away from this genie concept, because they teach it like it's magic. Like you get saved and alakazami, and just all of a sudden your choices don't matter. You can just do whatever you want because you're just going to get blessed and all this. Yeah, that's not true. You set something on fire. It's going to burn. I don't care if you sneeze in tongues. OK, so law number two. Every choice carries a consequence and you're going to get locked in. You got to live with what you choose. 
And then here come law number three. Law number three is your actions affect others. So in other words, law number one, you have freedom of choice. Law number two, every choice carries a consequence and you get locked in it. But law number three is that you are actually going to affect more than just yourself. Now, the reason we struggle with this, or one of the reasons we struggle with, with this in the West, in the Americas, particularly in the United States of America, is because we are raised on the rights of the individual. And that's kind of what you hear around you from the time you're a child, if you grew up here. So it's a little bit more difficult to understand that your actions affect other people. Because all we ever talked about is our rights and why should I have to do this and why should I have to do that? I stopped by to tell you anything that happens in Japan, then they get in the water and come over here. <laughs> we breathe in the same air, all this different kind of stuff. You ain't never on a highway by yourself. You don't exist in a vacuum. You are the seed of your father grown in the womb of your mother. Your father released his seed. God decided already who you're going to be. I just talked about that last week. Your mother carries you to term. All that affects them. All that affects you. And then your parents become a family of three, however many siblings you have. You don't live in a vacuum. You don't exist in a vacuum. Your actions affect other people. But a lot of things can kind of mess your mind up. Like if you're spoiled, you don't get that. If you're super privileged, you don't get that. If you're an only child, that's a little bit harder for you. If you're American, that's a little bit harder for you. But it's a law of God. It don't have nothing to do with America. Your actions affect other people. Things that you do is, is just not going to stay with you. So law number one, you have a choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing. Law number two is every choice carry a consequence and you have to live with what you choose. And law number three, your actions affect other people. These are the basic building blocks of the setup. You say, why would God do that? Well, it's a reflection of who God is. I don't have time to explain all that. It's a whole nother thing. But that's the basic setup here on earth. But everywhere in creation, heaven, earth, hell, in any dimensions we don't know about yet, it works like that because that's who God is, okay? And so if you don't understand that, then that's why sometimes you end up places you didn't want to be because you didn't understand why you were hollering about your freedom to do what you wanted. You was just talking about law one. There's two other laws in that mix. Law two is while you're doing what you want, going to be some consequences and you're going to have to live with them. Law number three, is that it won't just be you that's affected. That's one of the first things you have to learn as a parent. Your kids are following you around all the time with a little camera, taking video of what you do and say and how you live and all that, all the time. And then your kids are going to start reflecting back what they see you do. It's the most amazing thing, because sometimes you're not even paying attention to what you're doing. Then you hear your child say something that you said, you're like, oh, Lord, where they get that from? They got that from you, that's where. <laughs> Because no matter how much you kick and scream about how it's my life and my choice and my rights, it ain't going to affect just you because that's the law of God. So, like I said, I'm amazed at the number of Christians that can't tell you what I just said. So that's why if you just step back and think about the three laws I just gave you, you have a choice. Choices come with consequences that you have to live with and your actions affect other people. You will understand your life instantly better. You understand that you got to where you are right now because of the choices you made, whatever they were. But you say, well, some stuff to have it wasn't my fault and that's not fair because there's no such thing as fairness. Fairness is a human concept. It does not actually exist in life. Ain't no fair. What happened is that maybe somebody else did something that affected you. Okay. But ain't no such thing as fairness because the third law is that our actions affect other people. I'm going to show you what the problem is in a minute, but you need to understand them three basic laws. If you don't understand that, then you're going to miss your whole life blaming other people or whining and feeling sorry for yourself or doing a whole bunch of stuff that people do. OK, that's the setup. That's the setup. So the next question that, again, needs to be answered that I'm amazed that so many believers can't answer is how did we get in this mess? How, if God is a good. Here's a question that unbelievers ask all the time. And some Christians ask it too, but they don't have the answer, which I, I, I can't with that. I, I've seen people say it on TV. If God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there so much gun violence? Why are kids being gunned down 
and shot in school? Why are black people being shot dead in the street and choked out in the streets? Like our lives just don't mean anything. Like we're just a bunch of dogs. It don't matter whether we live or die. Why did my child die? Why did my mom die when I was a young? Why did my father leave me? Why did we have an accident? Why did my house burn down? Why did I get this disease? Why, God, why? If God is so good, y'all Christians always talk about how God is good all the time. Then if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? Well, that's a very good question. And it deserves a very good answer. The answer to the question is, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? Is because mankind chooses evil. From the beginning, God told the first man that he gave the earth to what to do and what not to do. When God made the earth, he made the earth as our kingdom. So God's kingdom rules over everything. He's sovereign over all, but he has a kingdom that lives in heaven where he lives. So when he said, let, let us make man in our image after our likeness in Genesis, he actually made the earth and the earth realm to be our kingdom. Because you can't be like God if you don't have a kingdom to rule over. So when he decided he wanted to make a creature in his image, you can't be like God without a kingdom. So he actually made everything in the, in the earth and the earth realm. When I say the earth realm, I mean everything under the sun, all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies, that's all ours. That's why we can see it. Everything in the earth realm is actually our kingdom. Like God has a kingdom, he gave us a kingdom. But remember the three laws I just gave you, when God made the first family, he told them what to do. He told them be fruitful, be multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth, fill it, take dominion. Anything gets out of order, you take care of it because it's our kingdom. And then God said, I gave you all the fruit and trees of the garden you can freely eat. But God said, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat that because the day you eat that. In English, it says, thou shalt surely die. In Hebrew, it says something closer to dying, thou shalt die. In other words, what God told Adam, Adam was the first man. What God told him is that if you eat that fruit, you're going to create cycles of death. He said, dying, thou shalt die. In other words, it's a death process. And so God told the first man that if you eat that fruit, it's going to produce cycles of death. Now, why? Why did the tree of the knowledge of good and evil produce cycles of death? And once again, a lot of Christians don't know what the tree of knowledge and good and evil is. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil is, is a chance to separate from God and go out on your own. The tree of knowledge of good and evil means that you will operate according to your own knowledge of good and evil, your own senses, your own perception, your own understanding. You will detach from God and go out on your own. So God was trying to let Adam and all mankind know that you are free to leave away from me if you want to. That's what that meant that you can know good and evil for yourself. You didn't have to depend on God. You didn't have to stay attached to God. You didn't have to listen to the Holy Spirit. You didn't have to listen to the word. You go out on your own. But God said, if you detach from me, you're going to die. Uh, more accurately, you're going to create cycles of death. God said the only way for you to choose life is to stay with me because he's life. He doesn't just give life. He actually is life. So what God was telling Adam is, is that you are free. Remember, I told you three laws. You're free, son. What I want you to do is take care of the garden. I want you to take care of the earth, this beautiful planet, this beautiful galaxy that I gave you. I want you to fill it. I want you and your wife to have children, fill the earth with people, with, with the family. Uh, you got plenty of food. Uh, anything gets out of line, take dominion over it. You can subdue it because this is your kingdom, son. And this is how I want you to run it. And he meant for us to run it in fellowship with him. He meant for us to act like him because we're his image, we're his reflection. He never meant for us to be detached from him. But he told the first man, if you want to detach from me, you can. You can grow a conscience. When God created us, we were not self-conscious. That's why they were naked and they weren't ashamed because they weren't aware that they were naked and they had no shame because they were God conscious. They were not self-conscious. Mm -hmm. You know that terrible angst we go through when we go through puberty and you go to school and you got like a pimple on your lip and you think everybody in school don't have nothing better to do but look at that big old pimple on your lip. It's so mortifying. God never meant for us to go through that. That self-consciousness, that comes from sin. That, that, mm -mm. that, even something like that didn't come from God. 
So Adam, the first man, had a chance to stay attached to God and reign and rule this earth realm and then have kids that were attached to God. And then we would have been cool. We would have been five by five. But the devil was in the garden and the devil got in Eve's head and made Eve think that all what God gave her wasn't enough and that there was something at a higher level if she ate the fruit, if she got into disobedience. So she ate the fruit first and then she offered it to Adam. And Adam knew that all what the devil said wasn't right, but he ate it anyway. As soon as Adam ate that fruit, then the earth got cursed. Then he got cursed. Then everything attached to mankind. Hey there, somebody came on, on Insta, how you doing? Everything attached to mankind got cursed. That's when all the stuff you hate about life entered into our kingdom. Adam did that. So when he ate that fruit, he detached from God, which means he died. <laughs> his spirit died first, and then his body died later. He detached from God, went out on his own, and created cycles of death, rheumatoid arthritis, dementia, Alzheimer's, rape, molestation, child trafficking, kidnapping, uh, 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 breast cancer, throat cancer, my mother died from breast cancer, um, prostate cancer, uh, strokes, heart attacks, hypertension, racism, racial violence, gun violence, all of that, that's when it happened, when he detached from God. And when he detached from God, he brought all of that into our bodies and brought all that into this earth system. That's when it happened. Is that in the Bible, Prophet Taylor? It is. Romans 5 and 12, wherefore by one man sin hath entered. You know what? I didn't even put my title on the screen. Let me put my title on the screen. I just looked up, I'm like, my title not even on the screen. No, not that. Uh, I put Prophet of Sheila's amen, although as a good amen. Here we go. There we go. So I'm talking about basics. So that is Romans 5 and 12. I'm going to put that in the chat. Romans 5 and 12, wherefore by one man sin entered. That is where all the stuff you hate about life, that's when it happened. If you've ever been raped, if you've ever been molested, I, everybody's been hated because of the color of their skin. Some kind of way, somebody on earth don't like your group of people. Um, if you ever got bullied in school, uh, if you've ever been afraid, all those things, those things came from sin. We didn't have any fear. We didn't have any shame. We didn't have any guilt. We didn't have any self-consciousness. We weren't growing old. Adam and Eve would have always looked like they did the day that God made them. No wrinkles, no sagging skin, no loss of fertility, meaning that Adam and Eve could have had as many kids as they wanted. They had unlimited fertility. And a God gave the first woman a body with no stretch marks, no menstrual cramps, no, no cramps on a period, and no pain in uh, childbirth. So in other words, Eve would have given birth to kids and it wouldn't have hurt. Because the way it is now, when a woman's womb begins to part and we go through what we call labor, you have those contractions, that hurts like a big dog. I mean, I'm not a woman, but just from hearing women talking about it, just from seeing the experience, obviously I'm a man, I haven't been through it, but just from listening about it, that kind of thing, because that was part of the curse they have, and I'll get there in a minute. But that's when everything that you hate about living on this planet happened, when Adam decided to separate from God and go out on his own. God said, if you detach from me, God said, you're free to go if you want to, because God is love. He does not force his love or his grace on anyone. God does not. The reason God didn't make us robots is because he didn't want us to serve him without a choice. I know a lot of people think God should have just made us robots and there shouldn't have been any trees in the garden. And then we could have avoided all this if God did it that way. I know a lot of people think that's the way it should go. I've heard people say that, that if they could create the world, it would be better than this. What you don't understand is that if God made it that way, then nothing would be real. What you mean, Prophet Taylor? I mean, if love is not real, if you don't have a choice, if we went up to God and said, oh, Lord, I love you. Of course we do. Because we don't have a choice not to. If you're the last two people on earth and somebody tells you they love you, of course they love you. Ain't nobody else around. <laughs> but if you got all kinds of options and then you say, I'll pick you. That's a choice, it's you that I love because I have options and I pick you. That's what gives the choice meaning because you have a choice not to. And I know a lot of people don't understand that. I know you wish, so many of us wish, God had done it differently. 
But if he did it the way we think, the way you think he should have done it, that life has no meaning. You say, well, my child is a straight A student. You say, well, my child is a straight A student. Another person say, my child is a straight A student. Of course they are, because there's no choice to fail. Of course they're straight A students. Everybody's a straight A student. Of course there would be, because there'd be no choice. See, so the only way for you to really have freedom and the only way for there to really actually be love is if you have a choice. That's why God put that, gave us the option to walk away from him. But he warned the first man, if you detach from me, son, you're going to create cycles of death. Now, a lot of people say when they get to heaven, they're going to find Adam and slap him because he unleashed all this. That's not a fair statement. Do you think Adam really had any idea what he was unleashing? Adam had to live by faith the same way we do. Adam had no frame of reference for death. Just think about it. If God said you're going to die, what does that mean to a man that was just created? He didn't know death. We know death. He didn't know, he didn't know what that was. He had to believe God. Remember, you hear me say it all the time. God does not require sight. God requires faith. Adam and Eve had to live by faith just like we do. They had to believe what God said is true. So to say that you want to meet them in heaven and give them a piece of your mind is not fair. They had no frame of reference for what death would look like. They had to believe God or not. And they both chose to disobey. Eve believed the devil. She believed that what the talking snake said was true. Adam knew that wasn't right, but he followed his wife anyway. They both disobeyed. They both ate that, ate that fruit. The fall happened when the man ate the fruit because the man is the head. Romans 5, 12, therefore by one man, not one couple. So when Adam ate that fruit, everything that we hate about living kicked in the bin. And if you've ever been hated just because of the color of your skin or all the curses on women, a lot of stuff women have to go through, that come from the curse or the fact that we have to work to live and slave labor and slavery and getting beaten with whips and getting on and being put in shackles like dogs and all the things that you hate about living on earth and all the unfair wages and how you work so hard and your company give you as little money as possible and everything you hate about living happened that day when Adam made that fruit. And I'm amazed at the amount of believers that can't explain what I just said. And you, you're telling people this wrong stuff. That's not God's fault. God did not want us to eat that fruit. Why would he have told, why would he have warned Adam not to eat it if he wanted it? Uh, when God made the world, where was the arthritis? Where was the HIV? Where was the AIDS? Where was the herpes? Where was the broken bones? Where was the car accidents? Where was the, the COVID-19? Where was the asthma? Where was all that when God made the world? I'll tell you where it wasn't in here. God didn't give us no world full of sickness or disease or racism or poverty. That, that is not the world that God gave us. But Adam didn't listen to what God said and he ate the fruit. <clears throat> God told him not to eat and created cycles of death. So now that is why now we're born, we grow old, we get hurt, we get damaged, and then one day we die. All that's because of the day that Adam sinned. If Adam had eaten from the tree of life and ignored the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we, got, we would have got locked into life. There would have been no need for Jesus to die. We would never grow old. We would never age. No wrinkles, no pain, no racism, no nothing. But Adam had to choose it. And he didn't choose life. He chose death. That's why it's here. Okay? So now, moving forward with that understanding, that is what springboards you into understanding why the Son of God became Jesus Christ and died on the cross. And once again, I guarantee you, there are so many Christians who keep talking about how Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but they can't explain all that stuff I just said to you. The reason that Jesus died is because God's law says that the wages of sin is death. So in other words, sin produces death, but sin also has to be paid for by death. Or the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Re remission means to wipe it off your account. So in other words, God said, all of your sins are going to remain on your account until something bleeds and dies to pay for it. Because where there is sin, there's a penalty that must be paid. Because just like God is love, God is also holy. Just like God is gracious, God is also just. 
And so as soon as sin becomes a part of the mix, there must be a payment or else God is going to judge it and God is going to destroy it. God is going to curse it in his wrath. So the son of God decided to become human like us so he could die on the cross like a man. And all of the penalty that Adam's sin and all of our sins deserve, he would take it in his body and he would pay the bill. So in other words, what Adam did that day came with a bill. So uh, the son of God decided to become Jesus Christ and said, I will take the bill. I will pay. That's why they beat the Lord. They beat the Lord because I deserve to be and you deserve to be. People always talking about how they whipped his back. That was a whipping that I deserved. That's what would happen to me if Jesus hadn't died. They spit on him. They caned him. They made fun of him. That was what I deserved for my sin. And so the Lord said, I will pay the penalty for you. Why would you do that, Jesus? Because I love you just that much. I will show you, Romans 5 and 8, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost said, we will show you, mankind, how much we love you by having the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, become Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Jesus is the savior. He shall save his people from their sins. Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah, the one that is has the oil of God on him to do what the Lord did to become that sacrifice on the cross. Okay. So the son of God became Jesus Christ. He said, I will take the hit for you. And the reason that we can now be saved is because it is illegal to pay the same bill twice. Good God Almighty, that's the best news all day. I'm gonna get there in a minute. That is why the Son of God became Jesus Christ, became human, so he could take going all the way back to Adam's original sin and then all the sin that we do, he had to open up his veins and get his body beat and so his blood could come out. His blood didn't have any sin in it. So Father God took the pure blood of Jesus with no sin in it and applied it to our account so Jesus' pure blood can then serve as payment. It's like if you ran up a big old credit card bill and somebody came in and said, I'll pay that bill for you. That's literally what happened. Except the Lord's payment wasn't money. His payment was his broken body and shed blood. So this is what I mean when I, when I say I don't understand how, how Christians can't articulate what I'm saying. And so the Lord applied his broken body and shed blood to my... All, whenever you see a movie about the passion of Christ, in other words, uh, when Jesus got nailed to the cross, that's supposed to be me. That's why the first time I saw the passion of Christ in the movie theater, I cried. I would have got on the floor and worship if the floor wasn't so dirty because, you know, movie theater floors are filthy. But I would have got on the floor on my face before God and worship when I saw how Jesus was beaten and how, how they, brutalized, they brutalized the Lord. They brutalized him. They punched him, they whipped him, they spit on him, they caned him, they put the crown of thorns on his head, they put a spear on his side, they put the nails in his hand, they brutalized Jesus. But the reason they brutalized Jesus is because he was paying for what Adam did all the way down for all of us. And to do that, he had to take the penalty. If Jesus didn't do that, then that's what would have had to happen to us. Never forget that. Never forget Next time you see a picture of a crucifix, when you see a little crucifix hanging on a chain or a picture of Christ on the cross, that's supposed to be you. That's supposed to be me. But he said, I love you so much. I'll take it for you. That's what he meant when he said, greater love had no man in this than a man laid down his life for his friends. So the Lord said, I'll take it for you. I'll pay it for you. Which leads me to my next thing. Again, we're today we're talking about basics. That is how you become uh, born again. Now, what it means to be born again is, okay, going back to when Adam died, the first thing that happened is that Adam's spirit got detached from God. Now, there's three parts to a human being. There's spirit, soul, and body. Your body is obviously your shell. You know what your body is. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your brain is not your mind. Your brain is a part of your body. That's the physical thing in here. 
your mind is a part of your soul. And your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then your spirit is a breath of life inside of you. That. Just right here. That's the breath of life. That's why when you put your hand over a corpse, the body is there, the brain is there, but there is no life because the breath of life is gone. That's why when you put your, your hand over the mouth of a dead person, there's no breathing because that part of them is gone. That's what happens when we die is that spirit part of us steps out, comes out, and the body goes back to the dust. So when Adam sinned, that's the first thing that happened was that spirit part of him disconnected from God and our spirits died. And then all them years later, our bodies die. So spirit first, then your body. That's how it happens. So what it means to be born again means God is saying, I will make that spirit come back alive. I will reattach that breath, that breath of life back to me and you can live again. I'm about to run around this table. Good God Almighty. God said, I will make you alive again. You can become attached to me even though you were born in sin and trespasses and even though you were born dead. I can make you come alive. How, God, how? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment you deserve and I can apply his blood to your account and wipe the penalty out so I can reattach you to me. And now I can give you eternal life. You can live again. The thing I created you in and for, you can have it again through Jesus. It doesn't come any other way. There's always a lot of debate. Have you heard people say there's more than one way to heaven and there's more than one way to get to God and you Christians are just narrow-minded? You heard stuff like that? Okay. Next time you hear somebody say that, then uh, uh, ask them this question. Let me see the shed blood. Right. That's what I thought. They just run in their mouth. Okay. The reason that Jesus is the only way to father the re reason that Jesus is the only way to God, the reason that Jesus is the only way to get to the kingdom of heaven is because he's the only one that paid. <laughs> you find me another leader that died for your sins anytime you find me that. Please find me that. And even if they did give their life, God would not accept their blood as payment because their blood is tainted by sin just like ours is, which means the payment wouldn't do any good. It had to be pure blood to pay for the sin. Blood with no sin in it. That's only Jesus. So that's why the Lord is the only way to get to God because his blood is the only payment that Father God accepts. Haven't you ever been in another country and you got your American dollars and they say, we don't accept that payment. You've got to convert your dollars into something we accept or else you can't do any business there. Don't you understand that? Well, that's what the kingdom of heaven says that you've got to convert. <laughs> you've got to convert this into something that we take up here and we don't take works and we don't take skin color and we don't take family name and we don't take morals and ethics and we don't take all that stuff y'all think is important. God said, what we take up here is shed blood. <laughs> that, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's what God said. So that's why the Lord is the only way to get born again, to get into the kingdom because his blood is the only payment that heaven takes. That is not hard to understand. And if you don't believe it, then wait till you die. You can always tell God yourself. That's why I don't argue with people. All you Christians are crazy. All prophet Taylor, I don't even believe in all that prophecy stuff. All we know, you just Looney Tunes. Okay. Okay. Because you're still going to die. Did you forget that part? And when you die, you can tell God yourself. Tell him face to face. Stand before him and say, I don't believe in you. You ain't real. And all this stuff you say on earth, say it to him. Because you're going to get a chance <laughs> to tell him face to face. And you will discover the same thing everybody discovers is God does not require sight. When you see God and you say, well, I believe you now, God just going to shake his head. He don't require sight. He requires faith. He requires belief, not seeing. That's what people don't get. So that being the case, God said, I'll make you live again because a way has been made so that your debt can be paid. So you can come back and be reattached to me and you can come right up in my bosom and I'll be your father again. 
Good God Almighty, I'm trying not to holler. He said, I'll be your father again. Through the son, you can become a son, a daughter, a child of God again. Do you understand? All right. Now, having said all that, I'm going to move on to the next. And the next part is <clears throat> the, the, because what a lot of people will ask is that, Prophet Taylor, if it's that simple, then why do we see so many things going on in the church? I'll tell you why. Because so much of what we've experienced is religion. What God is talking about and looking for is actually a relationship, a relationship with a person. And I'm going to prove it to you in scripture in just a few minutes. Hang with me. If you've been in church in, in, in any length of time, I guarantee you what they taught you was church work which is not the same as the work of the church. <laughs> when you get born again, your spirit is in the same state that your body's in when you come out of your mother's womb. So if you're a Christian, you actually have two birthdays. You have your birthday in the natural where your mother delivered you out from her womb, but then you have the birthday in the spirit where you accepted Jesus as your savior. And what happens is that your spirit comes alive again because God applied the blood to your account because you believed in Jesus. But your spirit is a baby the same way your physical body is a baby when you're first born. So in other words, even though you are now born again, you're a babe in the spirit. You're a babe in Christ, okay? You don't come out of heaven's womb full grown the same way you don't come out of your mother's womb full grown. You follow what I'm saying? And so what that means is that being the case, what that means is that just like when you are a physical, natural infant, you have to be cared for. Someone has to feed you, change you, uh, put clothes on you, protect you from the elements and all that, you, because you don't, you're, you're a baby. You can't do any of that for yourself yet. The same thing is true in the spirit, meaning someone has to teach you, teach you the ways of the kingdom, teach you the ways of God, teach you what it's like now to be a Christian because you're just a baby. And that is the point of breakdown for so many of us. Because so many of us, instead of getting a relationship with God, what we got was religion. Religion taught you church work, but a relationship with God is the work of the church. Okay, I'm gonna break that down a little bit further. Religion taught you church work, but the work of the church is to get you a relationship with God. They said stuff to you like this, they said, don't be a pew member. Don't be a bench warmer. You need to get busy. <laughs> get busy. Get involved. Okay, well, especially, especially if you freshly saved, that's church work. So you're out there, you're driving a church van, you're working in junior church, you you get on the Ursha board, not the Ursha board, the Ursha board, you get on the, the, the care committee, you get on the pastoral care, you do all this stuff, you start doing stuff. And that ain't it. Prophet Taylor, can you back that up with scripture? Yes, I can. I wouldn't have brought it up unless I could back it up. So let me tell you the first thing you're supposed to do when you get saved. The first thing you're supposed to do when you first get saved is sit yourself down. <laughs> Woo, I bet some of y'all have never heard that in your life. The first thing the first thing you're supposed to do when you first get saved, you are a baby in the spirit. You're supposed to sit yourself down and get the first things first. I'm going to show you in the scripture what I'm talking about. Let me put the scripture in the chat so you can read it. Okay, we are going to read from Matthew 22, and I'm reading out of the NIV. We're going to read from Matthew 22. Third, verses 34, I believe, verses 34 through 40. So let me write that down in the chat because I want you to look it up for yourself. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. So that's now in the chat. Let me briefly put it on the screen. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. That's where I'm reading. Okay, here we go. 
Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, that was another religious sect during Jesus' time. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees, that's another religious group, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Good gravy from the Navy. What did the Lord just tell you? Whenever God says something is first, seem like to me, you ought to put it first. This is what confused me. This confused me when I was a child. <laughs> the Lord said, this is the first and the greatest. The Lord said, what you're supposed to do is love the Lord with every dimension of your being, all your heart, your inner man, your soul, your mind. Remember, we just went through all that, your strength. The Lord said, that's number one. And then the Lord said, it's also the greatest. So what that means is that there's nothing above it. So what I have never been able to understand <laughs> is why in the world people go to church for two, five, seven, 10, 12, 15, 20 years and nobody ever taught them how to love the Lord. Cause he said, that's the first thing. And he said, that's the greatest thing. And you know, and I know that there are plenty of people who've been in church for years and they mean, they meaner than junkyard dogs. They mean, they mean like angry rock, rock ballers. They mean, now anybody can catch an attitude. Anybody can have a bad day. Anybody can lose their temper. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a pattern, a pattern. Because then the Lord said, the second is like it. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just told you that you're supposed to love yourself. So first you love God, then you love you. And then out of them two healthy loves, you love the one next to you. The Lord said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, any law I've ever given you and any prophet I've ever sent to talk to you was all about them too. That's out of Jesus' own mouth. If the Lord said that's first, <laughs> what we say is you got to get busy. Don't be a binge warmer. Don't be a pew member. You got to do all this stuff. That ain't what the Lord said. I'm going to show you that in scripture too. He said the first and the greatest is to love me, to love me with all that you have. And then you got to love you. The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself not love your neighbor instead of yourself. That's another thing religious people do. That ain't nothing but a bunch of false humility. You are just as worthy of love as anybody else. You need love just as much as anybody else. You're not more important than them and they're not more important than you. Do you see how religion just completely messes us up from what the Bible say? So the first thing you're supposed to do when you get saved is sit yourself down and learn how to let God love you. Well, why do you say that, Prophet Taylor? Because of the scripture I'm about to read to you now. And that scripture is 1 John 4 and 19. I'll put that in the chat and I will put that on the screen. 1 John 4 and 19. Now, 1 John 4 and 19 says this. We love him because he first loved us. So in other words, what we read in Matthew was what we're supposed to do. What I just read for you in 1 John is how we learn how to do it. It says, we love him because, what does the word because mean? It means that there's causality involved on both sides of the sentence. So we love him because he first loved us. So what that means is that the first thing you're supposed to do when you get saved is sit down <laughs> and learn how to let the Lord love you. Get to know your new daddy. Get to know your new savior. You know why? Because we are very familiar with our old daddy. There's nobody on earth that don't know Satan. Say that one more time. There's nobody on earth that don't know Satan. We are very familiar with our old daddy. But when we get born again, we're a baby. And we have to learn our new daddy. 
because the son, the son, the capital S O N, said that loving me with all that you have is the first and greatest thing. Okay, Lord, but how do I do that? First John four nineteen. You have to sit down and let let me love you. Let me show you my love. Let me show you who I am. Let me love you. And then as we learn to receive his love, we learn to love him back. Our love for him is a response to his love for us. Let me ask you a question. Is that what they taught you in church? Now, if they did, it was cool. Remember, I'm not trying to dog anybody out. Don't get what I'm saying twisted. I'm not trying to, to, to be negative. I'm asking you, was that your experience? If that wasn't your experience, then you see from the Bible, that don't make no sense. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to show you why that's important. If you don't think what I'm saying is important, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you the scariest verses in the Bible. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, I'm going to show you the scariest verses in the scripture. Here it comes. That would be Matthew 7. 21 through 24. Let me put that in the chat. Matthew 7, 21 through 24. And put that on the screen and I'm going to read that for you and explain it. I'm reading out of the King James Version. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's actually verse 23. So I actually meant to cut it off at 23. Okay. So that's actually, actually Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Okay. So what the Lord just told us. What the Lord just gave us was the scariest verses in the whole Bible. He just gave us the scariest verses in the whole Bible. Let me read it again. <clears throat> Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter to the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What did Jesus just tell you? Jesus just told you that there's a whole bunch of people, because the Lord said the word many, that have lived a whole life. The 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years of life on earth, doing a bunch of religious things, prophesying in his name, casting out demons in his name, have done many wonderful works in his name. They doing all that work all these wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The Lord just told you that if you are not intimate and if you're not intimately acquainted with him, then all the stuff that you do doesn't count. Good God almighty. The reason that's so scary <laughs> is because he used the word many. Remember that the Lord has access to all the people that have ever been. So when the Lord says many, he could be talking about quadrillions of people. There's going to be a whole bunch of people that ran around and spent their whole lives. You're not listening because the Lord is talking about judgment. Spent their whole lives doing a bunch of religious things, a bunch of religious work, a whole bunch of religious work. And they stand before Jesus and they say, look at all this stuff we did. Look at all this church work we did. And Lord just going to shake his head. He's going to be like, who are you again? Is he on my list? Michael, Gabriel, do you know this guy? And Michael will be like, mm -hmm. and they're going to check their list. And, and the Lord's like, we were never intimate. You and I were never close. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. And the Lord says, depart from me. In other words, the Lord said, all that religious stuff you did don't even count. The first time the Holy Ghost gave me that revelation, my brain said, Psh. all that stuff you did. Now, do you see how we have failed people in our organized religion, uh, religion institutions. When we told them that you need to get busy, no, you don't. You need to sit your behind down and get to know Jesus because he just told you 
that if you spend your life doing a whole bunch of works, but you don't know him, them works don't matter to him. I want you to notice what the Lord did not say. The Lord did not say, I give you 20 points on working with the kids. <laughs> the Lord said, I, I, I give you 30 points on working with the senior citizens. I give you, I give you 25 points for driving a church van. That ain't what he said. He said, depart from me. He said, I never knew you. We were never intimate. We never had a relationship. Then he said, depart from me. Get out of my face. You that work iniquity. Why does the Lord call that iniquity? Here's an even deeper level. Because the Lord is saying, you spent your whole life trying to make yourself look good. There's a whole lot of people that are saved and there's a whole lot of people that are super saved. <laughs> you know how you can go to Mickey D's and get a meal, but you say, no, no, don't give me the regular meal. I want you to supersize it. <laughs> Some people are super saved. You know, them the people where like if a woman is wearing a dress and it's beneath her knee and this other woman got on a dress and hit her ankles, she done turned her nose up at the woman with the dress at the knee because she thinks she's more saved than you. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know how some people speak in tongues, but some people speak in tongues for 14 hours in their secret prayer closet. And son, I went to my closet and I spoke in 14 hours uh, of different kinds of tongues. And, and you just might say a few words in your prayer language and not see, because they super saved, because now they think they're more saved than you. And some people just get so deep, they're crazy. Ain't no other way for me to say it. They stand in front of the refrigerator and they speak in tongues and they're like, Lucky Charms, a Captain Crunch. He got him out of Santa Monica, huh? And, and the Holy Ghost told me Lucky Charms. And I'm just glad I'm in his will today. You know, okay. People like, <laughs> people like that, they're trying to be super saved. See, <laughs> it's a relationship with a person. I got two kids. My son is my son and my daughter is my daughter. Nothing will ever change that. They don't, have, they don't have to try to be super kids. <laughs> that don't make them more my children. <laughs> that does not make them more my children. And like any father, you want your children to do well, but what you want is the relationship. What you want is the relationship. If you're a mom, if you have kids, you want your kids to do well, sure. But what you want is the relationship. Where do you think we get that from? See, so there's a whole lot of people running around here trying to be super saved. There's a whole bunch of people running around out here that their whole life is about proving how they are more saved than you. And they're always talking about, you know, all the stuff we do, whatever, blah, 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 blah. There's nothing wrong with serving the Lord. There's nothing wrong with, with, with building for God's kingdom. But the Lord told you that if you don't have a relationship with him, all the religious work you did does not matter. That's the scariest. Those are the scariest verses in the Bible because that means you can live your whole life and miss God. You didn't hear me. You can live your whole life and miss God. You can live your whole life and miss God. You can live your whole life. Be thinking you're working for the Lord. Be thinking that you're doing a bunch of religious things. Be thinking that you're super saved. Be thinking that you're doing all this stuff and stand before Jesus and start bragging on what you did. And Lord, look at all this. And the Lord just shake his head. Say, I don't even know you. So get out of my face. I See, I can't with that. I can't imagine living 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years and, and, and living all them years doing all this stuff. And you stand before the Lord and he's like, I don't even know who you are. So that's what I mean when I said that's how important what I'm saying is. That's why the Holy Ghost told me to say it. When you first get saved, what you're supposed to do is sit down and start spending time with your new family, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, next time, if the Lord say the same, I'll go into more detail on how you do that because I spent this hour talking about what, what to do. But next time, I'm going to show you how. Because, you know, that's going to take more time and, and I got to wrap up. But that's what I mean when I tell you. The Lord said many, there's going to be a whole bunch of folks that spent their whole life doing a whole bunch of religious things. And the Lord going to shake his head. Say, I don't even know who you are. I don't want Jesus to respond to me. When Jesus sees me, I want him to say, oh, David. That means I have to have a relationship with him now. Because it's not about what I do. Just like with my children. I don't love them based on what they do. <laughs> They don't have to earn my love. You understand? 
And so that's what I mean when I say if me being a man and me being clay and breath, if I have, if I can love like that, then how much more our father in heaven, he loves you. He wants to know you. He wants to be intimate with you. And we have done Christians a disservice by making them get busy and don't be pew members and don't be bench warmers. Now we got them doing all this stuff and ignoring what the scriptures say. And what the scriptures say is the first and the greatest commandments is to love him. First and the greatest commandment is to love him with all that we have. And the second one is to love yourself. And then out of them two healthy loves, then you love the one next to you. And the Lord said, all the law and all the prophets hang on them too. So why in the world are we teaching people everything but them too? <laughs> I didn't understand it when I was a child and I don't understand it now. All I know is I don't want to be on the wrong side of Matthew 7, 23. I don't want to be one of those people that spent their whole life, whole life doing a bunch of religious things and you completely miss God to the point where he don't even know who you are. Those are the scariest verses in the Bible. So that's why I said, that and and that's why you know the holy ghost leading of course but i mean i want see see i'm gonna say this a little bit and i'm gonna be through I, you heard me say it before but it ties in here that's why so many people missed the point of 2020. the whole point of lockdown was for us to be forced to sit down and find out whether we really know god or not everything happens for a purpose that's what i'm trying to get you to understand and a whole lot of people because i see them trying to rebuild the same stuff that was happening before the lockdown, I mean, you missed it. Everything that was happening before COVID, you missed it. You missed the whole point of 2020. The whole point of 2020, God literally shut the whole world down. Remember, remember, remember when Italy went on lockdown and we started seeing entire countries saying you can't fly in or out. Remember when that happened? We ain't never seen nothing like that. To my knowledge, in my lifetime, God shut the whole world down to give you over a year and a half of lockdown isolated time so you could see if you have a relationship with him for yourself or not. That was the point. Because God tore down all that religious stuff we was doing because all that religious stuff we doing wasn't nothing about nothing. That's why it got torn down. So I'm looking around and I'm seeing a whole bunch of folks talking about get back to normal and doing like it was and all that. And uh, the Lord just told you, you can live a over a hundred years and spend them 100 years doing a whole bunch of religious stuff and you don't bit more know God than my left shoe. And when you stand before him, he's going to be like, who are you? I See, I can't with that. I, that's not the fate I want. I want to know the Lord. I want him to know me. I want, When I call him, I want him to hear my voice and say, oh, David. That's what I want. And he said, the way to do that is we have to be intimate. You have to talk to him every day. So I'm going to get into details about how to build that intimacy. And if the Lord says the same, if Holy Ghost says the same, that's what I'll talk about next time. But I'm going to leave you with that. That was the point of 2020. That's what people didn't understand. And so many people are running around trying to go back to the way it was. That You missed it. Trying to rebuild stuff that God tore down. Why do you think God tore down everything? Because we didn't go to church for a year and a half. Some people are coming back now. Some people aren't. Some people are used to going to church online and some people ain't never coming back to church. <laughs> some people are never physically coming back to the house of God because they didn't got out to have it. Some people are, some people aren't. Some people are gonna keep the hybrid, some online, some in person. Some people got used to the online thing, but the point I'm trying to make is that God just gave us at least 18 months to find out whether we actually know him or not because you couldn't go nowhere. <laughs> so you didn't have nothing but time in your living space to get somewhere alone with the Lord and find out whether or not you really had a real relationship with God. And if you miss that, then that means a whole bunch of people gonna go back to doing a whole bunch of churchy religious things and they missed the whole point of the coup. They missed the whole point of the lockdown. Everybody that survived, because remember a lot of people have died, that was part of judgment too, but I explained that before, so I'm not gonna explain that now. But if you survive, the point was to give you a shot, to give you a chance to find out 
whether or not you actually know the Lord for yourself. I told a couple of friends of mine a while back, some people are never going to shake their pastor's hand again in this life. Some people, you're never going to shake your pastor's hand again. That stuff is gone and ain't never coming back. It ain't never coming back. It ain't never coming back. Because the point of this whole thing of being a Christian is to have an intimate relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And to learn how to let them love you and then you will respond to their love with love. And he said, that's what I want. So I don't care what anybody says about me. I don't care what anybody, what kind of attitude they have. I'm gonna stick with the word. And I want God to, I want to know the Lord for myself. And I want the Lord to use my life and my prophetic gifts and every gift I have to help me help others know him for themselves so that we don't have to spend our whole life. And you look up after you die and you done find out that you done miss God. Because after you die, it's too late. Your life has been lived and all your days are on the books and you're not going to get no more on earth. Why would you wait till then to figure out whether you really know the Lord or not? Just let that hit. So that's our prophetic word for today. Let me do a quick review because what I talked about today was basics. Now you see, you should have seen after this lesson how, how there's so much we've done wrong with our organized religion. And there's so many disservices we've done to people. And there's so many things we have missed because we never took the time to get to know the Lord. We thought doing all a whole bunch of religious stuff was what he wanted. And he said in the scripture that if you're not intimate with him, none of that counts. How did Jesus, that wasn't even a prophet said that. That was Jesus himself. Quick review, and then I'm out. Okay, uh, an intro, I'll talk about learning the basics, A, B, C, one, two, three. Music, English, nouns, verbs, adjectives, ad adverbs. I talk about the setup of life, the three basic laws of life. Uh, you have a choice between life or death, good and evil. Every choice has a consequence and you're going to get locked in it. And your actions affect other people. I talked about the original sin that God did not give us this world all messed up and cursed and full of sickness and poverty and anger and war and racism. That happened when Adam disconnected from God and went out on his own. And God told him, if you do that, you're going to create cycles of death. So he did it. That's why cycles of death are here. So we can't be blaming God for all the evil in the world. That's Adam's fault. That's why the son of God became Jesus Christ and became a man and allowed himself to be crucified on the cross so that he could take the, the penalty, so he could pay the bill for all of what sin costs. And that's how we can become born again. But when we get born again, we're babies just like we are physically, we're spiritually, we're babies. And so we have to grow into the kingdom. And so much of what we learn in our religious institutions is not scriptural. Because what he said is that the first and greatest commandment is to love him with all that, you, every dimension of your being, love him with all that you have. And the only way he said in 1 John 4, 19, the only way, that we could love him as if we first, there's that word again, let him love us. So the first thing you're supposed to do when you get saved is sit down and learn how to let God love you, not get busy. And the reason that's so important is Matthew 7, 21 and 23, that if you spend your whole life doing a whole bunch of religious things, it's possible to spend your 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, yay, even 100 plus years of life on earth and miss God completely. Good God Almighty. And those are the scariest verses in the Bible. All right, let me ask the Holy Ghost if he has anything else he wants me to say. Uh, some of you listening to me right now, the Lord is saying he's speaking to you as I'm talking. And he's saying he's going to continue the conversation. 
So some of you take this word, take this revelation, take this understanding, and the God, and the Lord is going to continue to do some work in your spirit based on the words that have been breathed out today. And there's going to be some life changes for you as you begin to seek a true intimacy with God, as opposed to being busy with a bunch of religious work. Your life is going to change if you receive what the Spirit of God has been breathing out. So Lord, say, Lord is saying this conversation is going to continue even after I sign off. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's it. Uh, so my sister asked me a question about the people in Florida perishing. Does that relate? Um, the Lord talks about how there's going to be tragedy and earthquakes and all that kind of stuff on earth, that that's just kind of what happens. And so that's why tragedy just seems to strike out of nowhere. That's what Adam unleashed on us. So, so anyway, so yeah, like I said, if the Lord says the same, if the Holy Ghost says the same, I will continue this teaching next week and I will show you actually how to build that intimacy. Um, so some people have asked me if they could sow into my ministry uh, financially. I do not do what I do for money. I do what I do because the Lord called me to do it. But if you want to bless me financially, I will. you can just sell that to me. I put my personal email in the chat. And thank you very much for that. And uh, remember I told you, uh, uh, this year I'm trying to increase my reach. So every video I do, I'm going to ask you to do uh, one thing. Well, the one thing I'm going to ask you to do in uh, this video is uh, I want you to uh, follow me on Instagram because I'm simultaneously broadcasting on that too, but also because when I am able to release the word of God on multiple platforms, then more people can see it and hear it. And that's what I'm going for. That's what I want to happen. I want to increase my reach um, because when, when the Lord gives a prophetic word, I want uh, to as many people as possible to hear it. So I'm going to put my Instagram handle in the chat and I actually will put it on the screen. So follow me on Instagram because I live a broadcast. So this teaching that you just heard is on Instagram too. But again, it's because I'm trying to increase my reach because I want the prophetic word to go forth as many different places as possible. So if you could do uh, one thing and follow me on Instagram, that would be great because I can't do that by myself. All right. God bless you so much. I know I ran a little bit long, but you know, I, I really want to listen to the Holy Ghost and be obedient. So like I said, the Lord says the same. I'll pick up next week and we'll talk about building that intimacy because we don't want to be that group of people that have spent a whole life and miss God completely. That, that doesn't make any sense. And that's why I said, I don't care who says what about me. I'm sticking with the word. I'm sticking, that's out of the Lord's own mouth. I'm sticking with that. That's what I want. That's what I'm going to talk about, prophesy and teach about as the Holy Ghost gives me utterance. And that's what I'm going to share. All right. Amen. And God bless. Thank you so much. I'll see you same time. Man, June is over, isn't it? I'll see you, see you same time. Let me see now. The 4th of July is coming up this week. So uh, let's, let's look at that date. I want to look at the date because the 4th is on a Friday. Okay. So that'll be a nice long holiday weekend, but I will be here on Sunday. So Sunday will be the 6th of July, a week from today. So wait. Am I looking at that right? No, I'm sorry. Sunday's actually the fourth, but I, I'm still going to be here. I don't. I don't think I'm going to take off that day. If the Holy Ghost tells me to uh, take off for the actual holiday, I'll let you know. On my Facebook page, I post it when I'm not going to be prophesying or ministering. But as of right now, I do believe I am going to be ministering on the fourth. So if you don't watch me live, that's cool. I just want to be sure I get the word out, and then you can go back and watch the replay. So as of right now, as I understand it, unless the Lord tells me different, I'll be here next Sunday on the 4th of July with my regular live prophetic word. Uh, and if not, I'll put something up on my page. And then if I do a live word, if you don't watch me live, then you can definitely catch the replay. So definitely go follow me on Instagram. And so thank you so much. And God bless. I'm excited about this word. I'm challenged by this word. And I want to live it out. Okay? Amen. God bless. I'll see you one way or the other next week. Amen.